this ill boy, you see, normal latency of 324 milliseconds, and a shift to the healthy hemisphere. So that means that in this area, over the, hemi the whole hemisphere again, there must be something that is shifting this activity to the left. Perhaps this is a reflection of an absence of the P3 in one hemisphere and depicts only the P3 in the, in, in the left, in the more healthy hemisphere, which you might think that it could be a source somewhere in the depth uh, in the left hemisphere. After he recovered and he was feeling good again, this is CT after one year, EEG after one year, looks beautiful. This stays. Only the P3 stays abnormal and it didn't recover. Why? I don't know. This is another example of P300 done in children with dyslexia, as I told you before. We know that uh, in dyslexia there's some, that's tentative of course, but that there are some disconnective syndromes uh, present in these children in which left-right hemispheres are not very well connected through the defects in the corpus callosum. This is uh, a theory and, uh, by uh, Nihokichin in, uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, from studies from uh, Kalaburda, we know that there are ectopic abnormalities in the temporal lobes of the left hemisphere most of the time that are perhaps the cause of this uh, disease, which is in 25% uh, familiar. If you do P3s in dyslectics, familiar dyslectic children, you see that only one hemisphere is active again. Perhaps we can move this over a little bit so that we can see. So you can see what that the activation is taking place mainly, mainly in one hemisphere. And the interesting thing is that this is not only in one instance that this happens, this, this is what we see in many children. Here's another one in which you see that the localization of P3 is somewhere, perhaps a little bit subcortical or cortical even, who knows. And this is in uh, accordance with the latest data that perhaps there are so many generators of which are uh, parietal recorder uh, uh, areas also uh, responsible. This is, for instance, a P, uh, not a P3, but a pattern reversal uh, VAP with its sources, also from a child with dyslexia, who showed abnormalities in the in the pattern reversal, where there were no visual defects, no left-right differences, and etc. So you, this is a whole field stimulation and you see there is a, a one hemispheric activation. So you see that there must be some disconnections between the two hemispheres to get these results. And I will skip these slides because they are not so clear, but these are also examples of uh, people with different uh, neurological disease, uh, hemorrhages, etc., with shifted P3s. So there's all kinds of localizations that you can find in patients that give you asymmetries in the P3. This is a uh, latest, ex last example I give you about a child who had a learning uh, problem, a dyslexia, in which you see here the, the normal average in the crosses of the didactical age in months, and this is what you see for this uh, uh, patient, the word spelling, the squares, which is a little bit less the, uh, than the average when we start at the, before the treatment, the psychological treatment, and then you see what happens when he is treated after some 10 months, and you see that the, in the, the, the dots, the spelling doesn't change very much, and the text reading is going also a little bit better, but stays below the average. You see the next slide, the in his intelligence profile, verbal, visual, spatial, just like other children, and concentration look just like other uh, average dyslectics. But this child was verbal, very clever, compared to the, the average dyslectic. So what we see here is P300, when we started the psychological therapy of the remedial teacher, 512 milliseconds, 
the maximum activity is over the left hemisphere the for the negative and the positive and this is what happens when he after 10 months treatment you see that uh, latency is shorter and the localization of the peaks and troughs is normal so this is an interesting thing so that means that not only structural lesions may change p300 but also mental processing so this makes it very difficult that means that you looking for sources perhaps of p300 is something that is perhaps the same has the same difficulty degree as your test of looking for verbal uh, localization of uh, verbal factors uh, in the, in the in this kind of uh, neurophysiological neurophysiological work but this after all your patients there is a lot of perhaps there is a, a hope because if you if you uh, and that's what i meant this morning by my question if you would look at let's say 100 patients and you would compare the data of normals and the patients and you would say well what what is this normal on or abnormal and you would look at different disease groups like here cerebral vascular disease dementia etc etc then you can look at results of all these tests and you can see how useful are they is it normal or abnormal that's the only thing that we want to know is it normal if it is normal then the patient must be okay if it is abnormal there must be something wrong then if there has a complaint then we can go further into into looking what it might be so we look at results we look at eeg fft the frequency fast Fourier transforms and we look at visual evoke potentials and p300 and then we look in, in in these cases the numbers show you the number of uh, abnormalities f uh, of the number of investigations that were done in the number of patients so you end up with a uh, an average number of abnormality for that examination that particular examination so if you put that into a graph of uh, p values the p fell off but this is p values using quite chi square test you can compare the different examinations to the results of other examinations so what you can see here if you compare ct for instance to frequency analysis then you see that the frequency analysis is very sensitive to functional abnormalities and that ct doesn't always find that and if you do the same thing for other if evoke potentials for other examinations you see here that we get uh, the same kind of results it is this very sensitive also and even the p3 shows you that if there's something abnormal in the latency or topography that gives you a clue to uh, pathology it doesn't tell you anything about the source you can know nothing about what source uh, what sources there are just like you use a television set and you don't know what is inside you can look at the, at the news and you don't and, and the news is important that comes out of it and the same way perhaps it sounds very stupid but you can use neurophysiological data in clinical settings without knowing what exactly is going on to find abnormalities this is uh, the conclusion of this examination that using uh, different that using different uh, neurophysiological uh, examinations are very sensitive in detecting functional abnormalities and this is of course only true or especially true for patients suffering from uh, functional diseases like dyslexia, headache, contusion, epilepsy, uh, AIDS, etc. Of course, I don't mean that if you have somebody with a hemorrhage that comes into your ho hospital in the night that you should uh, wait until the next morning for making an EEG. Of course, we perform CT also. But if you have a, the, the use of this study was that if we have in our outpatient department uh, people that suffer from all kind of things like you see here headaches if you find normal EEG normal frequency analysis normal visual evoke potentials and p3s then you don't have to bother about much more expensive examinations like CT and MRI and this is what I had to say thank you very much this is hard to already do now.
Can you use the microphone, please? FFT uh, is uh, very sensitive, but the problem on the clinical point of view is uh, uh, situate the, the, the point of cut because uh, uh, you must define uh, uh, what do you consider uh, um, a normal FF, FFT and uh, sometimes it's very, it's very hard because uh, what kind of method do you use? Uh, do you use um, the, the uh, SEDA test for significance uh, with uh, two uh, standard deviation or uh, you have your uh, own uh, control group uh, uh, related to age and compare with the, and you have your uh, special standard to define the, the, the abnormalities. And the same thing is uh, for some of the bokeh potential. It's very uh, difficult to, to define the, the normality and the, mm -hmm. and the wide range of, uh, of normality. Yes. Well, that's right. The way we, uh, we look at uh, frequency analysis is to compare the data uh, with normal data that uh, are made in our own lab and in cooperation with uh, other labs that are using the same machines, using the same algorithms. And another, and the most, but, but that's not enough. You have to look at, uh, and that's the problem with the frequency analysis maps, uh, you have to look at all the frequencies to be sure that there's nothing abnormal in there. Because you use the same paradigms as in normal EEG, of course. If you have an alpha uh, frequency difference between left and right hemisphere of 0.5 hertz, it will not show up in the Z transform, but it will show up when you look at the maps and you see left-right differences. So you have to look at these very carefully and use the paradigms of normal EEG, how to, to look at paper EEG, the same things you apply also to, to of course, to the FFTs. And, uh, and next to that, you can use something which is more uh, unambiguous by using statistics. That's right. And for the evoke potentials, I think th it is easier because evoke potentials, if you keep yourself strict to the unambiguous way that the global field power is predicting you the, the, the latencies, then you, get, uh, you can make normal latencies with normal persons and then you can compare these latencies with patients and you can make standard deviation and you find exactly what you want to know. And the topography also, you can make a statistical approach to peaks and troughs and you, like I showed you with the circles and then if something is outside two standard deviations, it's abnormal if you like it or not. Hans, um, if a neurologist is using a reflex hammer uh, then he tries to, to, to get some answer from the system and, um, and if there is, uh, well, some reflex doesn't show up, then you can get some conclusions from it. Is, is the P300 for you something like um, a reflex hammer? Or is it, no, I, I ask that because I, I, what I want to know is what, what, what theoretical thing is, is, is there behind the kind of things you are looking at? That, that, is, that is the final question. Yeah, first of all, we were intrigued, I will, this is a more historical question like medicine is. Uh, it goes first like this, that you are interested in the phenomenon and then you look at some people and you find something which is very clearly to measure. Then you want to know what is normal. So you start to look at 60 of pe uh, normal persons and then we performed a test that I didn't show you to find out if there was some relationship between uh, latencies of the different components and intelligence and then we were desperate because we found out that the less intelligent the subject the faster his P3 was and so we found a reverse uh, relationship which uh, uh, was not described by my knowledge in literature before and this will be uh, presented by uh, I think it published uh, by Frida Vinia and uh, Cox and, and myself. And then I thought, and that's what, what I explained, where do, do these P3s come from? So then I tried to find patients with abnormal P3s and from there on uh, I went into the bl 
the black because I don't know what to do with that because you, I, I think I cannot uh, only if you can well my result would be from this data that there are many generators to P3 and this is what I wanted I wanted to look for one or two generators something perhaps as was shown in the hippocampus and something parietal for instance but this uh, comes out as so many different areas that are active that I don't know what to do with this data. That's why I present this here, because it's much, much more like a question than uh, something to, to tell you this is how it is. This is the idea about the work that I did. And there's no uh, scientific way of approach, like you are perhaps used to, in a way that you plan an experiment to get something out of it in the end and that you then plan a new experiment. This is uh, evolvement of things that happen when you are on the, on the way. <coughs> Syphilis, you saw through it, very nice indeed. And uh, at the end of the, your demonstration, you saw what a map with the red area persisting after all the rest have been uh, more or less normal. Uh, my, we know that in neurosyphilis involving the nervous system like in meningoencephalitis, but the small vessels indeed uh, from neuropathological point of view. So my first question is, what was the future of this red area? And the second question is, uh, should you perform a SPECT scanner or an MRI because probably we will see the lesions of these small vessels? Thank you. Yes. Um, to start with your first question, the negative area was over the abnormal hemisphere not uh, positive. The negative area persisted for a long time over the abnormal hemisphere. And that's what we see sometimes more often in visual evoke potentials. They persist in a negativity around the area of uh, abnormalities on infarction or hemorrhage. And uh, the second part of your question is right. We could have performed MRI. This was in 86 and uh, we didn't do that because there was no MRI in Amsterdam, it's a practical reason. And later on, we, uh, he, when he was recovered, uh, we didn't do that anymore. We didn't thought it was interesting. And then the, the problem is that the waiting time at that uh, particular period was very long for doing MRI somewhere else in another city. Nowadays we have MRI in, uh, in the neighborhood of our hospital and it is much more easier to do. But you're right, you we could have done all these examinations. SPECT also, yes. But what I wanted to, sh to show is that neurophysiology can also show this. You don't need very expensive things. First of all, I was very pleased to hear once more evidence for the bilateral organization of the human motor function in terms of desynchronization not only of the contralateral hemisphere, but of the ipsilateral mm -hmm. hemisphere as well. Something which is in line with our findings from the electrical yes. data and from the magnetic data. Second, in order to make a comment about your yes. uh, and, and 200 to or what, I want to whatever. Ask you yeah. First, where the control lateral preponderance of uh, N200 was more pronounced over C3 or, or over F3 in the case of right? You can look at the data. Oh, well, it's gone. I, I, um, I think it was more in the parietal area. Um, I, I don't know. You have to look. Can I?
So this is central parietal. If you use the average of the maximum negativities with this, the standard deviation. It's difficult for me to comment in such case. I have expected something like this, that the contralateral preponderance will be mostly pronounced over the C3 and F3, because the medical about the sensory acute motor task were not only M1, <laughs> but the pre-motor cortex is supposed to be mm -hmm. active as well. But in such case, I wonder what but perhaps the, the sampling rate is not so good in this, uh, but I don't know. It might be a spatial sampling rate, which is different than in your experiments. Much different. Yes, yeah. right. This could be. And volume conduction effects as yes. well. Yeah. Yes, I think that's the one about the. Switch it been several attempts to uh, model the brain electrical activity and that is to say try to identify the brain generators that underlies uh, EEG or MEG recordings we can have uh, from scalp surface or near the scalp surface. This is known as the inverse problem. To do so one has to choose a model that is to say to define a geometry to define conductivity, physical properties, and also to define the source he is looking at. And to, when doing that, one has to be able to compute the potential distribution generated by a dipole, let's say, or a source in such a model. And this is known as a forward problem. I will try here to show you how the finite element method can help in uh, computing this uh, forward solution in a particular case of realistic head models. And I will emphasize my talk on uh, electrical potential since, since our lab it mainly, is mainly concerned with evoked potential studies. I will try to present some results obtained with this method and also to raise some problems related to realistic models in general. <coughs> As I said, a model of brain electrical activity is defined by mainly three points. The geometry you are considering, the physical properties, the conductivity, and the sources you are looking at. The, one of the most popular models, everybody is, almost everybody is uh, applying, is a spherical model. That is to say the, the head is considered as a multi-layer spherical model, three or four layers corresponding to the brain tissues, CSF, skull and scalp, for, for instance. And in this case, in the case of spher spherical models or spheroidal, spheroids models also, there exists, it's, it's a very simple model to deal with since you have analytical formula to give you the potential <coughs> due to a source, a di dipolar source, for instance. When you go a step further uh, toward realistic head models, then you have to do some numerical approximation of your solution. And there exist mainly two methods to do so. The, one, the first one is a boundary element method, which has been developed and used for several years now, and which uh, really makes some discretization of the surfaces of the boundaries you are considering. And then you can have an approximation of your potential on the surfaces. <coughs> the boundary element method is, uh, is, it is uh, as a limitation which namely is the fact that you can only consider isotropic conductivity. That's, and then we go to the second point of the model characteristic which is the physical properties of your layers. You can only consider uh, isotropic uh, medium, isotropic conducting medium. That is to say that the conductivity in a layer is the same for any direction. If you want to go to more realistic models of the, con of the conductivity, then you have to consider anisotropy, anisotropy of conductivity, which is likely to be the reality in certain uh, structures of the brain, like the skull or also the gray and white matter. 
For instance, in the gray and white matter, in the gray matter you have cortical colons, which uh, imply that the conductivity is more important in the direction of the, these cortical colons than, rather than across these colons. And also in the white matter, the conductivity is more important along the fibers than across the fibers. So if you want to go to more realistic models in this, concerning this aspect of the physical properties, you have to use the so-called finite element methods. And this is what I'm trying to talk about today. I would not go uh, much into details on the different sources you can consider, either dipoles or dipole layers or distributed sources. This has been already presented this morning, so I won't go further in this field. I'm just going to show you some example and the evaluation of our method based on equivalent current dipoles. <coughs> Uh, let's have a look at the computational complexity of those different methods. When you are dealing with spherical models, where the, form the solution, the forward solution, is given by analytical formula, even if the formula is rather complex for, uh, let's say, an isotropic medium, for instance, spherical medium, it's really easy to implement on a computer. When you go toward... Uh,